స్టార్ట్ చేద్దాం అని చెప్పారు గారు లైవ్ స్ట్రీమింగ్ యా లైవ్ స్ట్రీమ్ ఇస్ గోయింగ్ ఆన్ సర్ ఎగ్జాక్ట్లీ సర్ యా నౌ ఇట్స్ ఆన్ యా షల్ వి షల్ వి స్టార్ట్ ఎస్ సర్ రత్న సార్ కెన్ యు షేర్ దట్ లైవ్ స్ట్రీమ్ లింక్ అప్రాజు గారు uh mean when chaitanya you can uh, uh, initiate brother you can start yes, sir uh chaitu you have to unmute yourself yeah i've done let's sir yes i request respected participants please uh, look at the chat box that is the youtube live stream link please open the youtube live stream link in separate window and please mute volume in youtube video youtube live stream chat box lo link is there yes open a new tab yes sir it's already live is activated sir it is opening yeah. now can we uh, <coughs> chaitanya sir please start sir చైతన్య సార్ మీ ఆడియో అన్మ్యూట్ చేయండి not able to hear anything not able to hear anything chaitanya chaitanya not in a position to hear anything chaitanya not able to hear anything sir am i sir ha sir na unable to hear sir chaitanya sir meer audio ne set cheskondi ha chaitanya cheppandi em problem chaitanya చెప్పండి on the behalf of the management department of csc and staff of the i take it to all for 
this one national DP on the role of catching the hat in there's some problem with your there's some problem there's some problem it is a very wide range of experiences Still. So, Ratna, we will do one thing. So, just Chaitanya, uh, you mute Chandi. The principal sir will uh, take over, and uh, the <laughs> guest of uh, speaker, guest speaker, will uh, start. So, yes, sure. that's better. Good morning, sir. Morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, all the guests, participants present today. Professor Ramana Murthy Garu, Professor Sia Kennedy. And on behalf of MGAT, I welcome Professor Somaya Jiru sir for this FDP program on machine learning and data science role in artificial intelligence, jointly conducted by Department of MNH and CSC of Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Technology, Hyderabad. Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Technology is one of the premier engineering colleges in the self financing category in Telangana. Was established in the year 1997 under the aegis of Chaitanya Bharati Educational Society and is affiliated to Jawaharlal Nehru Technological University of Hyderabad. Institute has received accreditation for eligible six UG programs for three times from National Board of Accreditation New Delhi and MGIT also is accredited by NAC in A grade. The institute offers eight undergraduate degree programs and six PG programs. And from this academic year onwards, the institute has got extension of approval from AACTE for starting three UG programs in the <coughs> areas of information intelligence, data sciences, and computer science and business systems, and one PG program in artificial intelligence. Sir, for information, the Institute has received MHRD's NIRF 2020 ranking and we are in the rank band of 201 to 250 and in this constant effort and the untiring, untiring work that our young staff at MGAT are indulging in from day in day out that we could able to enter into the NIRF 2020 ranking and on behalf of my entire teaching fraternity of MGAT I would like to share to all of you that we have set a goal by next year we would like to achieve a ranking below 150 and I wish all my young staff, all the departments of computer science and engineering, information technology, electrical electronics, electronics and communication, mechatronics, metallurgical and materials engineering, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, <coughs> and the upcoming new EG programs in artificial intelligence and machine learning and data sciences and computer science and business systems to strive for this particular goal. And I wish all the participants who are going to join today for this Friday FDP derive ample inputs in terms of nurturing their interest in machine learning data sciences that are very much needed for artificial intelligence to be inculcated in their regular curriculum as well as to carry out in uh, pursuit of being part 
of make in make in india program of government of india thank you very much sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir <coughs> Is a very brief message to the parties and minutes of the FDP to address the participants over here, sir. Chaitanya? Murthy, sir, where do you start, Chaitanya, sir? Yeah. Uh, good morning to everybody. Respected uh, 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 principal, Mr. Jay Shankar Varu, and the chief guests of the today's inaugural function, Professor Somaya Algaru, Priyal and Somaya Algaru, and Professor C.R. Kareddi, and my distinguished colleagues of the college, uh, distinguished colleagues of our MAID, and the distinguished participants across the globe, I take the privilege to welcome you for this event. And you know very well, the event is named as Machine Learning and Art Machine Learning and Data Science. They are so role in AI. That means basically, these two are like uh, two hydrogen ions in a diborean structure. So they are going to I mean, support the entire AI for the ML as well as that machine learning as well as data science. You know, machine learning is basically related, concerned with automation, automating the automation and getting the computers to program themselves and writing software in a bottleneck and uh, making the data to do the work instead of somebody's doing. So therefore, there we need to depend on what you call how you can represent the representation. The machine learning is makes, makes a lot of uh, I mean uh, it makes a lot of effort for creation of artificial intelligence. In that we use some concepts like decision trees and then set of rules, instances, graphical models, and neural networks, suppose neural networks, etc. So all these things are going to be covered by our distinguished speaker. Today's speaker we have Dr. Uh, Bharat. He is from University of Texas, working with uh, the IBM research group and is a research scientist heading the research scientist group in that. So we welcome you and I wish all the participants to have a what do you call better stay and receive the best from the all the resource persons and best of luck. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, Professor C.R. Kennedy. Okay, sir. So, good morning, one and all. This is Dr. C.R. Kennedy. Okay, good morning, one and all. This is Dr. C.R. Kennedy on the behalf of yeah, Department please. of Computer Science and Engineering, Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Technology. I welcome our uh, each and every participants and uh, our namaskarams to chief guests and respected principal, sir. And uh, now I don't want to come in between uh, you and the uh, guest, guest of speaker. So now I request Dr. Somedul, sir, to address the gathering. Over to you, sir. Dr. Somedul, sir, please hand it over, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Oh, Principal sir. of the Media IT, Hyderabad. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible, sir. Somedul. Yes, sir. Yeah, very okay. much. Thank you. Please Thank continue, you, sir. sir. Principal. MJT Hyderabad, Professor Jay Shankar, Ramamurthy Garu, coordinators, and uh, today's chief guest from abroad, and participants, faculty of MJT from various departments. Very good morning to all of you. First of all, I thank uh, Professor Ramamurthy for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak as part of the inaugural function of this uh, uh, workshop or in other words, a faculty development program on machine learning and data sciences. Um, so I would like to give briefly about the importance of these areas. As mentioned by Professor Ramamurthy, data science, machine learning are all part of AI. And deep learning is also part of AI. In fact, each one, each subcomponent is, uh, is a subset of AI uh, compared to traditional AI. Today's AI is totally different, and uh, uh, you all know that uh, already government of India um, released a white paper uh, on AI, and it is now recognized as a highly critical growth area with impact across many sectors, including science, government, finance, healthcare, manufacturing, advertising, retail, 
and others. AI might, AI might just be the single latest technology revolution of our lifetimes with the potential to disrupt almost all aspects of human existence. You all know that uh, the co-founder of Coursera, Andrew Ng, and formerly head of uh, AI group, uh, Google, Google Brain, compares the transformational impact of AI to that of electricity 100 years back, with many industries aggressively investing in cognitive and AI solutions, and global investments are forecasted to achieve a compound annual growth of 50.1% to reach 57.6 US billion dollars by 2021. AI is not a new phenomenon for all academicians. It is a worldwide new battle only with much of its theoretical and technological underpinning developed over the last 70 years by computer scientists such as Alan Turing, Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy. AI has already existed to some degree in many industries and governments. Now, thanks to virtually unlimited computing power and the decreasing cost of data storage, we are, we are on the um, cusp of the exponential age of AI as organizations learn to unlock the value trapped in vast volumes of data. That means, ultimately, from the business point of view, whatever the type or kind or amount of data that is available with the organization, how quickly you get inside by using innovative performance-oriented models. So all these things coined as part of machine learning. AI is a constellation of technologies that enable machines to think or machines to act with higher levels of intelligence and emulate the human capabilities such as sense, comprehension, and act. That means decision making also should be automated. Thus, computer vision, audio processing can actively perceive the world around them by acquiring and processing images, sound, and speech. So that means what I want to say is AI yeah, for all now. AI yeah, is everywhere as part of uh, uh, the new AI, our machine learning and deep learning, data sciences, they are all part of this larger system. AI system can also take action through technologies such as expert systems and inference engines or to undertake actions in the physical world. You all know that there are different categories of AI, but uh, uh, from the uh, comparison point of view, I would like to explain very three, three simple categories, weak AI versus strong AI. First one is how do we compare weak AI versus strong AI? Weak AI describes simulated thinking. That is a system which appears to behave intelligently, but doesn't have any kind of consciousness about what it is doing. For example, a chatbot might appear to hold a natural conversation, but it has no sense of who it is or why it is talking to you. Whereas strong AI describes actual thinking, that is behaving intelligently, thinking as human thinks, with a consciousness and sub subject in mind, or in other words, subjectiveness in the mind. For example, when two human beings converse each other, they most likely know exactly who they are, what they are doing, why they are doing. So this is how a weak AI and strong way can be comparable. Then there is another kind of categorization called narrow AI versus general AI. Narrow AI describes an AI that is limited to a single task or set of number of tasks. For example, IBM's Deep Blue, the just playing computer, that beats world champion Gary Kasparov in 1997 were limited to playing chess. It would not have been able to win a, a game of tic-tac-toe or even how to pay. But whereas general AI describes an AI which can be used to complete a wide range of tasks in a wide range of environments, 
that means different types of environments are taken into consideration as such it's much closure to human intelligence so in a way generally I consider as a closer to human intelligence then uh, there is a third kind called super intelligence the term super intelligence is often used to refer to general and strong AI together at the point at which it surpasses human intelligence if it ever does while big strides have been made in artificial narrow intelligence wherein algorithms that can process documents drive vehicles or beat champion chess players no one has yet claimed the first production or development of general ai therefore it is good that um, the college mgit has started a program by inviting experts from abroad to uh, train the faculty members on the current areas of machine learning and data science which are part of ai but you know that ai is applicable every day as i mentioned in healthcare sector agriculture smart mobility then the retail sector the manufacturing energy smart cities etc in fact education and skilling is also a very important area today ai can also potentially help to solve the quality and access issues observed by indian in the indian education sector therefore uh, i am happy and also i congratulate the entire organizing team of the department of csc mjit hyderabad and other sister institutions for uh, organizing this prestigious program as principal mentioned uh, this is a very interdisciplinary course wherein all engineering students should learn and then pick up best skills for better employment and better opportunities with this few introductory remarks i thank you all for uh, giving an opportunity to speak on uh, as a part of inaugural address under this particular program thank you all thank you sir thank you sir thank you samayal thank you sir thank you very much thank you very much sir samayal thank you thank you, thank you. Thank okay. you, sir. Now, now shall we move to the introductory speech, sir? Yes, sir. By the yes, sir. Let's 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 say introductory speech. Please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. C R K. Professor C R K. Extend a very cheerful vote of thanks to Bharat sir. Sir, Chapman sir. No, no. We have look to start it. No problem. Go ahead. Go ahead. I will. Uh, I'll. Uh, we expect. Uh, Okay, so uh, Chaitanya will come in introducing the other. Uh, see, I mean, uh, the first person. Kindly go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Your valuable introduction. This was the first staff member in. Uh, Chaitu, you can uh, switch off your video. You are not audible. First point. Uh, Ramaraju, just a uh, mute. Chases are invited. Welcome, this person, Dr. Bharat Mandala. Bharat Mandala. In the research staff member and life sciences department at IM Research. Dr. Nandala joined the original Watson Research team in 2013 after the team won the Geopoly TV show and shifted the research focus to adapting Watson for the healthcare domain. His area speciality includes machine learning, natural language processing, and clinical formats. Prior to joining IM, he received PhD. Masters in business from University of North Texas. With this course, I'd like to invite today's resource person, the Radhandala Ocean. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chaitanya.
now dr can i request you to kindly take over sir Hello everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's uh, actually past midnight <laughs> here for us. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's an honor to present uh, about my research as well as our group's research and what we are doing here uh, at IBM. Uh, and uh, I would like to start uh, by saying thank you so much, Dr. Ramanu Muthi sir, uh, for giving this opportunity uh, to me. It's an honor uh, to present to your uh, faculty of the esteemed university, uh, as well as to your students. Thank you. So today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what is artificial intelligence or what is NLP and how it is making a big difference in the field of uh, clinical or healthcare. So, and also uh, briefly introduce about my research uh, and what I have been doing uh, for last eight to 10 years or 13 years. So the topic uh, for today is artificial intelligence uh, for healthcare. And uh, about me, uh, I'm a research scientist uh, at IBM Research, and uh, I have a PhD and master's in computer science uh, from University of North Texas. I finished my PhD in 2013, uh, and I joined IBM Research in, uh, 2000, in the year of 2013. Uh, so before that, I did my bachelor's uh, in uh, Srinidhi Institute of Science and Technology, uh, so which comes under, of course, JNTU. Uh, and um, my research interests are artificial intelligence. And uh, from last few, few years, I, my focus shifted to what natural language processing can do in the healthcare or in the clinical domain. So currently, I am in New York. I have been hearing a lot in the in the news uh, about all the COVID-19, etc. So this is uh, about me, like where I was and where I am now. Um, so uh, in a great introduction given by Dr. Somi Arjuligaro uh, about saying uh, about Deep Blue and IBM uh, computer that beat the that beat Mr. Kospro. So. And following that, like IBM uh, tried to do another grand challenge after beating the chess player, uh, is uh, actually going and participating in the Jeopardy challenge and uh, have an NLP or AI question answering system that can answer the questions asked in the challenge. So I was part of the team. Um, so briefly, because like the challenge was in 2012, I joined IBM research uh, in 2012. And then we started to focus. So I joined the same team. Uh, then we started to move our focus or shift our focus towards uh, bringing uh, clinical NLP or uh, bringing IBM Watson into the clinical domain. And also we tried to do a lot of open domain question answering for different types of questions that were not encountered during the Jeopardy uh, challenge. So those were my two research areas and that were I was focusing on from past few years. So I'd like to say, uh, about like electronic health records. Uh, so this is uh, very common uh, in uh, most of the uh, developing and also the developed uh, countries. So this shift has happened from paper-based uh, paper based patient records to the electronic uh, health records. And the objectives of that is contained. Uh, someone saying something? Sorry. No, no, please go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Please go ahead. Once, once, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, the the idea is to contain the information, which is basically store the information about the medication history, or diagnosis, or treatments of the patient that were given, and allow access to evidence-based tools that can provide uh, help to the patient's uh, healthcare, and also to automate and streamline the provider uh, workflow. So these are the three objectives with which electronic health record systems or electronic health records have been started and a lot of countries adapted uh, electronic health records. But there are several issues with the electronic health records. So the major issues are lack of interoperability uh, between information technologies or EHR and EHRs, and it is expensive to set up and maintain and uh, drop in physician productivity because of adapting to the latest technologies 
And this may come as a shock uh, to everyone. So actually the EHRs increase the workload on the physicians because the, with the EHRs, much more documentation is required uh, for physicians before, during, and after the patient visit. So, and also to, to alleviate these issues, uh, several small uh, technologies have been developed and one of them is like copy pasting or, you know, macros, templates, but this has bloated the information that is in the electronic health record <coughs> because, so why, because to save time, so the doctors have been mostly copy pasting the information from previous notes or previous visits. So this puts the patient safety at risk and impedes quality of care uh, as updates or changes between visits can be overlooked or not even documented uh, properly. So what does this lead to? So one of the bigger issues with electronic health records and that amount of time it is taking uh, for physicians or doctors to really write it. Uh, so it is estimated that at least 35% of physicians in developing world, and also, of course, 50% of physicians in the, in the United States, because in the United States, considering the legal issues surrounding the healthcare, so you have to clearly document everything that happens within each and every individual visit. So this is causing a, tra uh, a tremendous amount of stress on physicians, and there is a lot of burnout. So physician burnout is negatively associated with many things like professionalism, altruism, and the quality and safety of care. So at the individual level, a physician burnout has been associated with uh, cardiovascular diseases, alcohol use, depression, suicide, stress, etc. Burnout has also become a complicated uh, as ha also have like adverse financial effects on the uh, indirect adverse uh, financial effects on the practices and the organizations involved. So here are some of the major contributing factors uh, of burnout. Uh, so EHR, as you can see, like it is contributing the most. So the the the, the total amount of burn from the total amount of burnout, 21% of burnout is coming from just using uh, EHRs. And among those, the biggest uh, factor is writing the notes, which is notes, the 33% because it, it takes a tremendous amount of time to document the notes. And the other bigger chunk is 14% coming from like basically reviewing the charts before the visit. And lack of information is causing a, more, a large amount of stress to the provider as well as have potentially negative implications on the health of the patients. So what can be a potential solution that can alleviate these kinds of issues that we are suffering today with the electronic health records? So as a grand challenge, after IBM Watson, uh, we started adapting or moving the whole IBM Watson into healthcare. So that started in 2013. So we have been working on these systems or as a grand vision for the future to alleviate the potential Excuse me, but it says... Yes. Hello? Yes. Uh, but it says you are not, uh, your uh, frame has been uh, sir, like... Uh, uh, audio we are getting it but uh, video we are not able to we are not able to see you and uh, slides also oh so can you is it same for everyone refresh or... yes sir for everyone sir okay um... can you refresh yourself sir or you can uh, rejoin yeah thank you So technical team, uh, kindly take charge. If some issues are there, uh, let the speakers know and uh, otherwise uh, it will be... Sure, uh, sir. Sure, sir. Thank you. Bharat? Yeah, meanwhile, uh, we can announce that uh, the speaker will be rejoining shortly due to a frame uh, refreshment rate is uh, slow. So I request all the participants to kindly, hold. yeah, now it is fine. Yeah. Now it's fine. Sir. Okay. Please continue. So the overall idea, uh, I, I think I have to share my screen. You can see my screen, right? 
sir? Yes, yes. Okay. So the overall idea is like, can we build a potential solution that can alleviate these kinds of issues? Okay. So what our grand vision is basically, can we develop a solution that can be problem oriented uh, summarization? So can we develop a summarization system with which the doctor can quickly get the information that he really wants at the, at the point of the kit. So the idea is, first of all, uh, the, the patients may have like a lot of problems. Like, so this is one uh, patient, it's a Jane Doe, uh, so it's a, it's, it's a de-identified patient. But this patient has a lot of problems, like, uh, like GERD, to diabetes, to hyperlipidemia, obesity, et cetera, et cetera. So he may have to see a lot of specialists over a period of time, and uh, he may have to get like a lot of uh, his visits uh, from his uh, primary care physician. So the idea is to centralize and build a problem-oriented uh, patient record summarization. So as you can see, so these are the problems that were extracted. Uh, I will talk about it in more detail, like what NLP and what technology that we have used to de develop this system. So the problems that you see on the, lights, on the left side are all the problems that the patient has. And once the doctor comes to a visit, and then these are, as I said, like these are automatically generated. So once the doctor is kind of knows like what he is, what the patient is for today, now if he knows like, okay, he's here for diabetes. So if he clicks on the diabetes, you can, if you can highlight or, or extract all the information that is related to diabetes, like insulin, liraglutide, metformin that the patient is on, and what are his lab results, and what are his lab values, and also what are the potential orders or like the procedure orders that we have uh, that the doctor has prescribed to the patient. So if you can list that, that, that helps doctor solve like 50 to 60% of the information needs. So what is the next step? So now let's say the doctor is not happy, but he needs more information what happened with the uh, patient. Now if he selects and digs down a little bit to the diabetes mellitus uh, type two, now he has another dashboard like where he can see over a period of time, what happened to A1C goal. So what happened to his A1C levels? So his goal is to maintain the A1C less than 7%, but he he tried to maintain that from 2011. So you can see the summary and what happened to the patient's uh, A1C level. And also you can see like a lot of medications, uh, what are the medications that he's on and which are related to only diabetes, mellitus labs, weights and blood pressure. And also the most important thing is summary of last visit so sometimes the doctor all the doctor wants is to know what happened in the last visit but at the same point of time the notes that are written are so long like you can have like 400 to 500 sentences in each of these notes so the doctor doesn't really doesn't have that much time to go through the whole note so what can we do so we can develop solutions that can extract the information and provide a second summary of information that the patient can really uh, go through, uh, that the doctor can really go through at the point of care. Now let's say this is not enough. Now doctor wants to go deeper. So uh, one, one point that I want to add here, from the summary, you can actually able to identify reason for increased A1C without reviewing the whole note. So that's the whole point of summarizing the note. Now he can also dig in, okay, what happened to his endocrinology? So now let's say he wants to do one more. So these are all summaries that were extracted. These are not the actual note. The actual notes are so long, as I was saying, they are like thousand lines or 2000 lines, but the doctor can just go through this and get all the information needs that he has. Like all he has to know is like, okay, what happened? And what is the treatment plan that was prescribed for the patient before, uh, before in, the, in the last few visits? And also, once you know what are the medications that he has, now, the doctor has to know one of the biggest issues, right? Like adverse reactions or adverse drug reactions is one of the most important uh, issues that the whole healthcare uh, runs around because like your approvals or medications, anything surrounds around adverse drug reactions and the studies which are clinical trials that are related to it. But from this information, like the doctor can really know what are the adverse drug reactions that the patient has. So if you can extract this information, these are in like, you know, before five years, two two years, three years. So as an example, in 2011, the patient was on metformin for diabetes and he was getting diarrhea. And doctor doesn't really have time to dig and go and read all the information. And also you are switching between the doctors and patient is not, patient doesn't know much about what metformin is, what diarrhea is, etc. 
So if you provide such an information, now when the treatment plan is provided, doctor can provide a much better uh, health care uh, to the patient. So that is the overall idea. Now, let's say you still need to go and dig more information. You can provide like search technologies. Search technologies like semantic find, which is tailored towards uh, electronic health records. Now, the doctor wants to know uh, about the medication liraglutide. So he searched for liraglutide and uh, he gets like a bunch of notes where liraglutide is mentioned. And also the most important point is it's not only liraglutide, but it's Victoza. Victoza is a brand name uh, for liraglutide. So if you can extract and show information like that, that will help a lot. So this is one use case of semantic find, but there are many others which I will show here. So now uh, when, when the doctor sees, okay, I saw like, okay, so there is a worsening HTN that is mentioned in the HD, uh, in this note, which is like worsening hypertension. Now I want to go dig deeper. I don't want to search for worsening HTN. I will search for HTN. HTN is basically hypertension, which is uh, another big point in the clinical notes. There will be a lot of abbreviations uh, that are mentioned. So now, as you can see, the doctor typed in HTN, but there are many things that came out, like which is blood pressure was very high, blood pressure 184 by 72. So blood pressure 184 by 72 is an indicator for worsening hypertension. So such a connection can be made only if you have a very good NLP technology that can potentially understand clinical notes and potentially tailored towards the clinical notes. So now you want to know um, more uh, information, like let's say this is another example where you provided like difficulty in breathing. So you saw shortness of breath, uh, dyspnea, etc. But this is, so let's say the patient comes in and he says, okay, I have difficulty in breathing. You search for it and you found it only once. It's not even mentioned. And the most of the times it is mentioned, so there is as negated. So it's not a positive mention as you can see here, sorry. Uh, as you can see here, 12 matches are basically for negated. So that means most of the notes are basically saying no dyspnea, etc., which are almost like a boilerplate or template stuff the doctors use when they write the notes. So my point is like the, the whole point is to build on like what we actually need. So to do, to do such a solution, what do we need? So those are the technologies that depends on NLP and AI, which I will introduce now. <clears throat> there was a great, great introduction provided by uh, the speakers already about NLP and what it can do. But I will just summarize in like one or two words, uh, which also relates back to my uh, research back in when I was a PhD student. So NLP refers to a language spoken by people like Telugu, uh, English, Japanese, as opposed to artificial intelligence languages or artificial languages, sorry, like C++ or Java or C. Natural language processing is a technology uh, that you used uh, to aid computers to understand the human uh, natural language. The technologies are, as you know, like one is IBM Watson, Apple Siri, which we use, uh, or even Google search, which is basically information retrieval. And also there are several NLP technologies behind it. While humans can easily master a human as a, as a, lang a language, the ambiguity and imprecise characteristics of the language make NLP difficult for machines to implement. So here is an example. I can hear bass sound, which is like a music. He likes to eat grilled bass, which is a fish. So a lot of people can easily sense it I mean, humans can sense it. Okay, these two are diff two different bass. One is sound. Uh, I, I know it's a music because there is a word sound and hear. And when I see eat, okay, I know it's something. It may not be a fish, but it's, it's something that is eatable. So these two are two different bass. So I, I want to provide this one example because my uh, PhD is on word sense disambiguation. So this is the ambiguity in the language and how NLP can address the ambiguity and resolve this ambiguity is a bigger problem. So that is where the AI started and that is where AI stopped in 1960s and that is where again AI started in 1990s. So the whole NLP AI surrounded around one problem which is ambiguity in the language. So in 1960 they said yeah we don't have a system that can really understand uh, whether this bus is fish or whether this bus is music so now we, 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 don't, we want to move the field in a different direction, which is basically building the knowledge sources and 
let's see if we can build systems which are machine learning or NLP in the future. So from 1960 to 1990, most of the uh, efforts were in building the resources like WordNet, uh, which is uh, one of the most important one for LISC. And, uh, techno and as the technology went by, Wikipedia has become a bigger, role, bigger resource for all the NLP technologies that was built over the past uh, few years. So as I already introduced, clinical NLP is little complex than the actual uh, NLP because clinicians are, as I said, like they are extremely busy. Their node structure is really different. So this is a node. So for a, this doesn't even look like any of the papers or any of the documents that we really see, which were most of them are really well written. But clinician notes or physician notes are really not well written. So it's it's kind of like I, I don't want to use the word mess, but it's a mess. So you can see uh, there are several structured imports like medications uh, and uh, the physical exam and a lot of abbreviations that were used. Uh, only the physicians can understand. Like, for example, PT means patient and HGB A1C is hemoglobin A1C. So these kinds of abbreviations are very, very, you can see them with highest frequency in clinical notes. You won't see it in any other uh, types of notes. So some of the basic NLP uh, things that uh, in clinical NLP are identifying the diseases uh, such as like diabetes and HDN, which is hypertension. Uh, which is an abbreviation in this case, and uh, also identifying the modifiers like stopped, started a medication, and also linking them to the UMLS or Unified Medical Language System resources, which is basically an entity linking uh, problem. So which is basically normalizing the mentions that are mentioned in the note. The other problem is relation extraction. Uh, which is another well-known uh, NLP problem, but this is all tailored towards clinical NLP. So what do you want to know? Like whether something causes, whether something treats. So metformin uh, treats diabetes, but metformin actually causes nausea or fatigue like when it is taken with care. So, and also as I was saying, like you want to extract these modifiers. So once you know like what happened to your medication, like, you know, stopped or started, et cetera, so that can actually help a lot of, or provide a lot of information for the doctors. Okay, why did it, so once you know it stopped, okay, then you can go dig in and see like, okay, why did it, why did the doctor stop? Why did in that visit this, they decided to stop this particular medication? Okay, there may be an ADE. So this is the information that the doctor wants to uh, provide uh, better care. So, and another uh, well-known, so these are all fundamental technologies. So abbreviations, as I was saying, the large number of abbreviations are in are ubiquitous in the clinical notes, like years, YRS, year old, YO, or SAH, etc. And headache, you know, HA, nobody knows HA is headache except for the doctors. And this is like an architecture uh, that we have built over a period of time. So I B so as I was saying, this is all coming from IBM Watson. And from the IBM Watson, we kind of uh, our whole research team shifted to IBM. Uh, Watson Medical, and now it's called IBM Watson Health. Okay, so this is still built on like a lot of fundamental technologies that were used in IBM Watson, like Apache UEMA or DUC, which is uh, Apache Distributed UEMA Clustering Computing. These are all available for uh, free, which are Apache licensed, so anybody can use uh, for free. So the overall idea is like the electronic health record has both structured data and unstructured data. So the structured data has the medication procedures labs that are available as databases. So the patient has a database, but the unstructured data is written by the doctors, which are clinical notes. So we wanted to build a pipeline that can basically process both structured data and unstructured data and extract the information. So that is the overall vision of the top part of that. And, this, and the bottom part is like basically taking the structured data and unstructured data, what are the NLP technologies or AI technologies that we can build so as you can see in the bottom of the image, we, uh, as, as the field is pro progressing, we build these technologies. So we had rule engines, like which is in, I don't know, 1995s or 98s, IBM uh, had a team that was working on NLP. Uh, they continued, and then we built feature-based uh, machine learning algorithms, like which, which are 
which depends on techniques like navbase or support vector machines etc as the field passed by in 2012 or 13 so deep learning uh, made a comeback uh, because uh, i attribute a lot of the success to the computers that have become faster rather than these technologies being innovated at this point of time so the the computers are faster now so deep learning technologies made a comeback because the models can be learned faster so at the time we had the ideas like all the people all the pe- experts in nlp had ideas back in 1970s 80s but at the time we don't have computers that can process that faster so with the gpus tpus that are available now so we also built like several techno- several of these technologies using uh, deep learning so there are three layers to it uh, to make it uh, easier so we it is segregated into three layers the fundamental technology which is basically recognizing the tokens from the text or sentences from the text parts of speech tagging semantic parsing name extracting the named entities in the text like diabetes or hypertension uh, resolving the abbreviations and disambiguating these abbreviations so whether as i was saying like like abbreviations can have uh, multiple expansions so you have to find the right Uh, expansion based on the context which is a sub problem of uh, word sense disambiguation so you have relation extraction which is recognizing the relations so the next level is basically very tailor- tailored towards uh, clinical uh, documents like how how do you extract goals that are mentioned in the clinical document how do you extract plans that are mentioned in the clinical documents or you want to know whether the so assertion is basically what is the belief status of the physician when he wrote Uh, a note like is the medication being stopped started or is a, he said no dyspnea or he said uh, hypothetically may patient have dyspnea which is kind of like hypothetical so can you extract these kinds of uh, information and the note sections is like as i was showing the clinical note you have multiple sections like procedures in one section medications in one section assessment and plan in one section so but this is not like a fixed format so you have to extract or identify these sections basically using some nlp or so as simple as like okay you can write few rules saying hey if the section starts with pmh then i believe it's a pmh section if the section starts with uh, a and p then i say it's an assessment and plan and you can go as complex as uh, deep learning models like where you can take the advantage of sequential sent- sentence learning models or you can go uh, feature based models like where you use a crf or a conditional random fields basically or to train these uh, models so there are various technologies various options that we have built for each of these uh, problems if you go one level up so which is the overall view that we actually saw in the first uh, slides first few slides so you want to generate the list of problems and you want to provide a consolidated medication timeline semantic find like where people can actually search if they need more information extractive summarization which is also known as textual summarization in the uh, open domain nlp and you want to identify the relations between the mentions that are in the structured data which are medications and the problems that you have extracted sorry i'll take a pass one second okay so now now we have uh, we saw like a broader picture of what uh, these nlp technologies are uh, that we have uh, in ibm and also what we have built as a research team over the period of years now let's dig a deep, little deeper and understand one such problem so because the uh, considering the time we have so i would like to dig down into one problem and show like what we have developed and how it can potentially make a difference in the uh, future so the topic that uh, i will focus today is adverse drug event re- reaction extraction because adverse drug reactions or adverse drug events are like as is one of the most important things that that is con- as considered as one of the most important things in the field of uh, clinical uh, clinical domain so just to give a broader picture uh, this is what uh, it is about so you take a medication you get the adverse reactions you take the medications for let's say diabetes but you get you know dizziness you you get sweaty you get confused now you 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 don't even tell the doctor because you don't even know this is an adverse reaction that is caused by uh, some medication so maybe after one month or two months or few months you you continue to take that medication then you may go to a doctor 
and the doctor asks, hey, what happened? Like, did you get any, did you feel anything bad? Like over the period? You will say, yeah, sometimes I felt dizzy or sometimes I had nausea, et cetera, et cetera. So the doctor writes that. So the doctor writes and notes, okay, so the patient has nausea. Okay, I'm reducing the dosage or I'm completely uh, stopping the medication. Now, after five years, you continue this medication, but the doctor never tells you, I reduced your dosage. He will just tell you, yeah, I'm writing a different medication for you. Now, after five years, you will see a new doctor and uh, now the do that doctor can actually increase your uh, medication because he doesn't know what happened before uh, five years. So the overall idea is like if we, if we can extract these adverse re drug reactions, so we can stop at the point of care, which are basically the biggest problem, the diagnostic errors. So to put as a definition, ADE is commonly defined as an injury resulting from medical intervention uh, related to a drug. ADEs are among uh, major public health concerns uh, in both morbidity and uh, mortality. Uh, there are several pre-marketing clinical trials, um, especially in US. There are three phases of clinical trials you have that they observe with animals, then a small portion of uh, patients and a large portion of patients, then they release it to the market if the FDA approves. But then begins the bigger thing, which is the post-marketing surveillance. So let's see on a larger scale, what's going on with this medication. So then the FDA can you know, stop uh, a particular medication from the market and call out, uh, and it can make a recall of that medication. So there are spontaneous reporting systems, such as FAIRS, where uh, the physicians or patients are also the medication vendors can actually go and report the adverse drug reactions that have that they have observed. Uh, however, previous studies have exposed various in inadequacies because it's underreported. There are biases because uh, it may be good for the co most common uh, diseases, but for the rare diseases, maybe only thousand or two thousand people have the disease in the whole world. Now, who knows like what happens to them like when they take this uh, medication. Several efforts have been made uh, to automatically extract from disparate information uh, sources, but they are all mostly like they are helping uh, the cause, but they are still evolving. So I'd like to specifically talk about two challenges that we have participated uh, as a team. Uh, so the first challenge was organized in, there are many challenges that we have participated uh, over the period of time in the recent years, but uh, with respect to adverse drug reactions and the clinical uh, documents, there were two challenges. Uh, one is uh, organized by uh, Massachusetts University and the other one is uh, organized uh, as a challenge continuing the I2P2. So this is very pretty much related to EHRs and uh, can you extract all these adverse reactions and how you can uh, make the make the potential, make the healthcare better. So. The, in the MADE uh, challenge, we have, uh, so this is all coming to, you know, mostly towards AI. We step, we are stepping away from the, we are stepping away from the introductory part. Now it's more AI. So it's mostly, I'm kind of assuming uh, the listeners know, like some of the techniques like supervised learning or unsupervised learning. These, at least the kind of things that people do for train uh, supervised machine learning models. So, Traditionally for supervised, I'll just give a brief uh, two line summary. Uh, so for the supervised models, you need to have a manually annotated data set so you can train your models. Just like how you can teach your kid saying, okay, so you have you show them 10 apples or 10 different kinds of shapes of apples, then they will kind of realize, okay, so the apple looks red and okay, apple has the shape, etc. So you have to show the machines a large number of things so that they can understand. So that is the supervised uh, machine learning. So in the main challenge, they these are de-identified, which is kind of uh, removing all the patient-specific information uh, because here HIPAA is a big thing. Uh, so 1089 um, patients, uh, longitudinal EHR nodes were annotated, which has like 21 patients uh, from the University of uh, Massachusetts Memorial uh, Hospital. Similarly, there was another data set from N2C to 505 discharge summaries from uh, medical information mart for intensive care uh, clinical care database. So these are annotated with drugs, which is like lisinopril here, and reasons, uh, 
what is the reason listen up so if you read this sentence listen up take listen up for 5 days for hypertension so that is the reason it's been prescribed but the patient reported cough so that is the ade and you also have its attributes like strength route form frequency duration and the dosage so the strength is like what is the 30 mg or 40 mg or how do you take your medication whether is it oral or you know like through an injection etc or what is the form is it a tablet or an injection and what is the frequency do you take it like every day or only in the morning or like every 6 hours etc so and also in, in the other additional part only in the main data set is also identified they are also identified all the signs or symptoms that are mentioned in the uh, note and and also their severity so for example patient report severe cough into c2 would not annotate those because they annotated only uh, ades and reasons and attributes but this one they annotated ades reasons but also they annotated all the signs or symptoms which makes little better because you can train better models to distinguish between where a particular sign or symptom is a, a ade or a reason versus it's a sign or symptom so to start with like there are uh, problems in the clinical uh, documents so there is a text wrapping uh, that auto text wrapping that happens uh, in the clinical ehr documents which puts new line characters all over the place so there was a wrap around 80 characters it's not exactly 80 uh, it's around 80 so these are this goes back to the older systems where you can't exceed 80 characters in a single line so it automatically puts a new line character which makes a bigger problem uh, for people who work in nlp because you you have to you, it's the, the sentence boundary detection becomes harder so here is a spacey uh, if if people who work in uh, nlp uh, they would have heard about it because it's it has it is a technology that's out there and people started using it's python it's easy to use etc so if you take that uh, if you take spacey then if you just run spacey on this documents now you have like four sentences which is not true right you actually have only two sentences in the tabo snippet but spacey detected uh, four sentences so we wrote rule based uh, system very simple rules you know whether if if particular thing is around 70 to 85 characters uh, whether i want to replace the new line uh, if it is not around the 70 to 85 i just respect the new line and some rules which are very specific to uh, the clinical text now this is the customized uh, spacey i don't want to go dig in all the rules but uh, so now we we were able to detect these uh, sentences accurately and coming back to the tokenization so this is the sentence this is one of the sentences i mean the common way you, you can see is like lot of sentences look like this in ehr documents albuterol 90 mg 2 pf q6 prn for 48 to Uh, 72 hours no one knows what it means that's what it means albuterol 90 mg 2 puffs every 6 hours as needed for the next 48 to 72 hours so that's what it means so if if you give it to a, a spacey it did split at 90 but it did not split at 2 pf and it did not split at q q6 prn so now if you want to rely on such a tokens for your nlp system it is not going to help because your system takes q6 prn but it doesn't understand it has 6 hours as needed that's what q6 prn means so we customized uh, a rule based system again like on top of spacey built a lot of rules that is for uh, clinical domain and here is our output showing albuterol 90 mg 2 puffs everything is split so the red and blue are kind of like the boundaries so q is split 6 is one token prn is one token so that's how you you kind of understand that so it it actually it's it's an important problem because so this is what the kind of text that you deal with in the clinical world so these are some of the statistics uh, around like what what are annotated uh, in these data sets and uh, <coughs> these are the attributes these are the sign or symptoms reasons and ades and uh, they also annotated uh, severities around these uh, diseases so and they also annotate the relations but the relations are not only in the sentence so if you see uh, if you look at this example so patient presented uh, patient is kind of remote presented with trickle bone illness 
okay then starts next sentence started on doxycycline then then starts next sentence which is patient reports nausea so now the connection you cannot rely on technologies that actually do single sentence relation extraction so you have to go beyond a single sentence so especially for drug ade and drug reason so for ade relations 32% of them are intersentential for reason 51% which is almost more than half are intersentential so they the reason and the drug are not even mentioned in the same sentence for more than 51 for for approximately 51% of them so we started with uh, i mean again so how do you represent these things uh you have lisinopril 30 mg so you can use like the begin intermediate and outside uh, tag inside and outside tagging which is well known bio tagging to represent these things so we started with that uh so how do you represent that lisinopril is beginning of drug and uh, 30 mg is begin of strength and mg continues so it's an it's an it's an intermediate or inside of uh, the the token and then again a begin of uh, frequency etc etc so this is the representation that we used uh, initially so we trained uh, deep learning models tailored towards clinical nlp uh, so we use uh, word embeddings that were trained on a large number of uh, electronic health records we have parts of speech embeddings we have dependency tag embeddings we have character representations uh, etc we used uh, by lstm crf uh which has like the backward lstm and the forward lstm and the hidden layer and then the traditional crf layer on top to uh decode the uh tokens so <coughs> that's the overall summary as i was saying we used pubmed etc plus ehrs and trained the word embeddings to initialize uh, these uh, networks and we used convolutional neural network for obtaining word representations using all the uh, characters then uh, we did a relation classification so once you have that okay so now now that i have uh, all my entities drugs uh, such as drugs ades and reasons etc extracted now all i want to do is classify the relations so now uh, we used attention by lstm uh, which has the attention mechanism we used word embeddings and also the type embeddings so we explicitly said uh, these are my targets and these are my sources so lisinopril as a drug it's a source and allergic because it's already extracted by your ner component as our target uh, codes that we have supplied to the deep learning model that kind of helped um and this is an attention by lstm for relation classification uh, that we have trained uh, rather than relying only on single sentence relation extraction we picked almost seven sentences uh, to get the drug ade and uh, reason relations um and for the other attributes because most of them are in the same sentence only few of them go here and there the one sentence before and one sentence after so we picked uh, the neighboring sentences also as the context to extract the uh, relations but this is a pipeline approach so we used name entity recognition and then we used uh, relation classification any of suffers from lossy representation of overlapping and relations so here is an example you have ferrosamide you have hypotensive she is on ferrosamide on the day of intubation and became hypotensive hypotensive so she was taking ferrosamide and she got hypotensive she got hypotension she became hypotensive that's adverse drug reaction right but requiring another medication which is norepinephrine which is actually treating hypotensive now going back to our tagging scheme that we used earlier we actually assign one tag to each and every token right now we really can't assign a correct token to hypotensive so do we assign adverse reaction or reason so if we use pipeline methods that is one disadvantage and then intercontextual sentences intersentential context determine the type of the entity so in this example as you can see so the 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 intersentential context is what determines whether something is a reason or something is an ade or something is kind of like a sign or symptom that is mentioned in the document if you look at only presented with trickle bone illness then you think if you read only that then you basically think it's a sign or symptom but if you read the next sentence then you think it's a reason and similarly for the other one so if you read only started on doxycycline uh, if you read only pa uh, patient reports nausea then you think it's it's a sign or symptom but 
when you read the previous sentence started on doxycycline patient reports on here then only you think oh it's an adverse reaction so these kinds of things will be missed in the uh, pipeline approach so what we did is we did a joint approach where we can by definition uh, a, a certain sslif is marked as ader reason by the relationship it keeps but by the relationship it keeps with the drugs so what we did we replaced all ades reasons and sslifs with the generic concept label in the first stage did the same by lstm crf second stage the relation classification model actually determines whether something is an ader reason or an sslif so that is a little novelty that we did so and then we we have some details on how we have how we did the training how we did the negative sampling to to get the negative samples etc so these are our results uh, so from the documents with 90 f score 0.9 f score um, we were able to extract drugs and most of the attributes we did really well like 90s and 80s etc but for the reasons it was only uh, 57 or 0.578 um this is with the sequential model and the ade it's even worse like it's only 0.47 so then we did the joint model so which kind of like uh, improved the uh, the reason and ade as the examples are shown so this is what is. and similarly for the relation extraction which is kind of like the end to end task you, you identify your named entities and also you extract the relations which is kind of like the overall goal so for that also we we observe the same uh, phenomena so this is organized as a challenge so we it was uh, there was a blind set that was uh, that's like a hold out set by the organizers and these are the results on the blind set and then the organizers release the data set uh, the blind set for writing a journal etc so these are the results 14 teams participated 28 submissions our su system achieved second place in ner and first place in the end to end uh, challenge so this is the journal um, that we wrote uh, to drug safety so that's the, the the top one is the overview paper of the whole journal uh, from university of massachusetts and the bottom one is our uh, paper or the journal that is in the same uh, same journal so if you can see like that uh, so we are the top system in the end to end uh, like we are, we beat the other uh, systems by a considerable margin uh, which is almost like 2% so immediately there was a next challenge which is n2 c2 kind of like in a month or so so they started organizing another challenge so th the only difference as i said they did not annotate any signs or symptoms which makes the task harder because you don't have negative examples to train your ade or reason model now similar data sets similar phenomena ad is for 23% and uh, the relations intersentential 32% drug reason or intersentential same approach uh, made uh, same as made we did that ner re then we kind of went like one step further so what we did we trained an external model for identifying all the sign or symptoms using made data so we used made data we trained another model which can identify all the signer symptoms in the document which is kind of like helping your helping auto generate your data to train uh, better models so we used that did the same same our joint approach then these are our results without the so with the joint approach we kind of did okay uh, so for ad it's it's very bad like it's still 0.38 but then we kind of bring in the uh model from the made data so it kind of improved to 0.455 so those are uh, here so this is all good so this is uh, so for the end to end task it was even worse uh so it was only 0.41 on the end to end task so these are the participation results there were bigger participation 21 teams 46 submissions large number of universities from uh, us and large number of corporations like alibaba everyone people like alibaba philips uh, etc participated so, so teams from them so we kind of did okay in this challenge so we are in top 5 uh, so here is a top 3 so they they don't have a lot of significant difference and here we are but we did very good in recognizing the ades and reasons so the blue marks indicate the ade and reason so if you observe only one team is better for recognizing ades because the challenge is all about ades the attributes etc are kind of like add ons so and also for the reason we are in top 3 top 3 ish so that is the 
overall result that we have obtained there. And then we said like, okay, we didn't do well in this. I mean, we could have gotten first, uh, we didn't do much. So we, we took some key takeaways though, which is joint approaches perform better than pipeline. Deep learning systems outperform CRF and SVM or feature-based models. Significant improvements is still required for drug ADE and drug reason relation extraction. So, and then we said like future models can benefit from better encoding schemes that can model sentences with multiple drugs, effectively incorporate the larger context to capture long, long distance relationships, leveraging knowledge to capture implicit relationships. So that was our, that was the transformation uh, to our next work. So in this sentence, you have two drugs, lisinopril 30 mg QHS, mitrizapine 15 mg PO QHS, right? But you, lisinopril is only related to 30 mg, lisinopril is not at all related to 15 mg, or lisinopril is not at all related to QHS. This was one of the biggest error category for the attributes that we observed. So what happened is system went aggressive and kind of linked lisinopril to both 30 mg as well as 15 mg. And similarly, mitrazepine to 15 mg and 30 So there were a considerable amount of uh, mistakes that happened due to this. So what did we do? So with the latest technique, we kind of modeled it a little differently. So the idea is we take the target drug, which is lisinopril in this case, and we provided an encoding scheme that can only mark 30 mg and QHS in this case and mark all of the others as O's, which are kind of, I am saying the model, only these are related to my lisinopril and I also provided a tag in the bottom saying lisinopril, you are the target drug. And when we, we do two things in the same setting because we have two drugs. So this is kind of like drug centric. So now we went to metrizepine. When metrizepine is the target drug, only those were activated in the encoding scheme. All the others were O's. All the others are outside, which are like turn off. So we train the model with these kinds of encoding schemes as a first step. So that does two step joint step, uh, joint model. First, we recognize all the drugs using by LSTM CRF. Same, uh, kind of the same architecture, uh, but we we used, we, we identify only the drugs. Everything is turned off. So only identify the drugs. Now comes the most complicated one, like which is like drug centric model. So now that you identify drugs, can you identify all the information because everything is linked to drug, right? So we want to extract its attributes, its reasons, its adverse reaction. So everything is surrounded by it. So now once you identify the drugs, like can you provide a joint, take the joint encoding scheme that was introduced, uh, aforementioned joint encoding scheme and take that. And we created one instance per drug mention to train the models. So this can extract all the entities and relations with respect to the drug simultaneously. Um, pre-trained word embeddings from EHRs, uh, random embeddings from others, and CNN for character to word transformations. So here is another thing that we did, which is kind of like position embeddings. So the position embeddings we said, hey, this drug is at zero, which is which is the drug's position. So and then we said one, two, three on the positive side and minus one, minus two, minus three for the negative side. But also we we didn't send send the uh, one hot vectors, but we actually send the representations of these things uh, to the model. We also said type embeddings by saying like, okay, so this is the target drug. We also said O for all the other words, but one small thing we did is we also mentioned other drug. So if a sentence has two drugs, for one drug we said target drug, for the other one we actually said it's a other drug. So that is the representation that we use. So these two things actually kind of made a difference. Then we proceeded uh, by using, so we expanded this model by using ELMO embeddings uh, so which is kind of like the contextual uh, embeddings that were created on a large scale. Uh, on a, It's an unsupervised model uh, that was, that uses multi-layer uh, neural bidirectional uh, language model on a large corpus. So what we did is we took that model, we trained on the PubMed corpus and the clinical NLP to initialize our uh, embeddings. As so a next step, we did, we, we, here we are kind of building on like, the, the, the join model on top of that, we used ELMO embeddings. Then we used positional attention. So the attention mechanisms were introduced recently. Uh, the idea is very simple. It, it almost, I, I can say, it's kind of like a similarity between two things. So if you, do, if you are looking at one thing, what is your next attention goes to? What does your eye catch? 
that's the kind of idea but this was there for a long time but once the deep learning world kicked in it became like a big thing in the past few years so attention mechanism have been proven to be effective for especially the long distance because you see one thing so if the doctor sees listener pill he his mind actually or his brain actually searches for things like hey is there a cough mention is there a hypertension mention so that's that's kind of the attention so we used uh, so there were self attention mechanisms in even in our relation classification model that draws the global dependencies of the inputs by capturing the relation of two tokens which is kind of the similarity but we kind of modified it and said like position attention mechanism which kind of builds on top of the uh, self attention mechanism i'll show you one example like that may help so here so the idea is to take the target drug and we see like what so once you see the target drug what do you place your attention on and once you see the current token what do you place where do you place your attention when you compare with all the other tokens so you can combine so this that, that's why it's called position attention so in the self attention you would have had only the second part it's kind of like similarity between all tokens or all pairs of tokens but here we also augmented that with taking the target drug as centric and measuring the similarity between all the uh, all the current tokens so this kind of is another uh, build on that we did on the existing model next we did knowledge joint which is a certain degree of uh, background knowledge is actually assumed especially in the medical field so when they are writing the note the doctors lot of things they mention is so here is a very nice example so if we don't know if we don't have a medical knowledge these two kind of look like the same sentence he has history of muscle pain on crestor he has history of diabetes on metformin exactly same sentences nothing different except for the except for the disease names and the medication but if you show it to a layman or person who is not a medical expert they think they, they both can be ad they both can be reason but if you show it to a doctor then only they know whether something is an ad or this is very implicit so these kinds of things the doctors write so you need systems that can actually understand this kind of implicit information so for that we try to bring in or like the previous research suggests like using knowledge bases can benefit these kinds of uh, systems so what we did we took a large database as i introduced face has this big database of reports that people or doctors or the healthcare uh, institutions report to it so we took that database we created so this is the database structure so we have indications in the database we have outcomes and on the right side what you see is like the actual count of uh, information so this nopril was uh, in 9000 9003 cases in the reported cases it's not in in reality but in the reported cases lisinopril occurred with hypertension so basically the if the patient has hypertension hypertension lisinopril was given 9003 times in the reports and lisinopril caused cough to 103 uh, patients so we took these and created knowledge graph embeddings uh, so this is the representations that we have uh, created using the uh, taking those large the database are huge like 9 million and 10 million which will again lead us to a different topic which is again another research direction that uh, we have been taking uh, maybe that that journal will come next year next uh, month so we we are submitting to one of the journals so so this is the overall architecture now you have like uh, based on this large corpus you have representations for each and every concept that is mentioned in these uh, documents so the idea is take the rx norms which is like the medications and the medra which is the coding so these two are uh, coded to medras and rx norms take this information augment the data with all the concepts that are in the umls which is like a huge resource uh, and transform the original graph to a word level bipartite graph and once you have this word level bipartite graph generate graph embeddings using techniques like line or uh, node to vec which is kind of an extension of word to vec and then this is the overall architecture so on the left hand side what you see is the join model with elmo and with the position attention and on the right hand side what you see is the knowledge augmentation part like how we are taking these knowledge bases and creating and taking those embeddings and augmenting into the Uh, deep learning architecture so here are our results after doing all that so this is the current uh, state of the art when i say current uh, before 2 or 3 months 
Now, these are our results. So we actually beat the current state of the art. The current state of the art is 52.95 uh, for the committee. And um, for which is a committee approach, they use like a lot of uh, models like CRF, BioLSTM, CRF. And then they use mechanisms like voting mechanisms to decide like what goes, what label you use for each and every of these tokens. But then we kind of abstain from using the committee approach. We kind of wanted to build like single model and show the value. Um, so these are our results on end-to-end -end task. And if you can see, like for drug reason, the best is 57.92 and ours is with the knowledge joined over say 64.96. And also you can see incrementally improving for each and every of these things. With the joint we saw 59, when we incorporated Elmo, it kind of improved a little bit, but went down for the AD. I mean, it, it kind of helped um, for all the other things. But with the position joint, like once we brought in the position attention mechanism, it improved a lot, like from 3% to 5% in each of these, but not a lot in the attributes though, uh, because they, they are already doing pretty good. And then the knowledge join kind of improved like three to four uh, percent for especially for the adverse reactions in capturing the implicit uh, things. This says like the EHR nodes are like really implicit, and you need to take advantage of both external knowledges and the techniques that are coming out, like which are like the NLP techniques. I mean, there are latest techniques like BERT, etc. So how do you combine these things, and how do you adapt to electric electronic health records, or you know the clinical domain or medical domain? is very important. So here is the recent journal um, that's um, out there, uh, if, uh, if, if anyone is interested. So this is published in JMIR. Um, so it's available for uh, reading. So the key takeaways are NLP is booming in healthcare, which is very good. Uh, but the field of NLP is not perfect. As you can see on the left side, the graph is growing. I mean, the number of publications are increasing. There are 500, 600, and it's getting to 700, et cetera, as the year goes by. But NLP is not perfect, as I said, because it's hard. It, the, the, there are a lot of challenges in it. There are a lot of challenges in NLP. And then there are a lot of ch challenges, especially with respect to clinical, because of the things that the doctors do. But NLP can make a huge difference in providing uh, better healthcare. Uh, for the patients in the future. So this is the future work. So all these studies, all the evaluations that we did are intrinsic, which is kind of relying on precision, recall, F-score, all these numbers, which are well established in the community. But we have to measure like how useful are these, right? Like we, we have to get to the doctor. So that is, a, that is a big, big challenge considering the EHR systems are a little old and then the, there are not an easy way to adapt these kinds of technologies into the EHR system. So there are a lot of challenges, but we have been working with two multi uh, specialty hospitals, which are huge hospitals in uh, UH, in US uh, from last uh, few years. But still there are a lot of challenges. I mean, adaptation is a, is a big thing. And then they always, they, they are not, even if you get to 80% accuracy, the doctor won't be happy. They will say, hey, this is not working. So that's the kind of world uh, we live in. So what we wanted to do is like take these tools, maybe, you know, do like pilot studies, like put it in front of the doctor with the EHR, see if they can use like for three months or six months and see if, they, if it is useful for them. And if it is not useful, also we will learn a lesson saying, okay, what do they really want? I mean, we can capture all the things that they are using, maybe by using the click properties or click statistics. Uh, and uh, the time spent, etc. So if you can capture all those things, then we can see, okay, so these are the things they like, these are the things they don't like, this is where we have to do the improvements, these are the new things that they are excited about. So we have to build, we have to make that kind of progress uh, in this world. So coming to the research perspective, uh, so the first one is more like a commercial perspective. The second one is like the re research perspective to promote, uh, the idea is to organize community challenges. Uh, which we are actually working uh, this year from our team, like uh, we are planning on organizing two challenges to promote research in the field. So if you can come up with, so if 10 people put together, they can come up with a better solution. If 15 teams, all the experts from the world join the challenge, they can come up with a better solution. So that's the idea. 
So as I said, like the, the, the major part is like integrating these technologies into the EHR systems. Thank you everyone uh, for the opportunity. So, sure. and, uh, special thanks to Dr. Raman Murthy, sir. Uh, this is a great opportunity for me. Thank you, sir. But sir, thank you. Sir, we have uh, some questions from the participants. Yes, sir. So the one question is, uh, what would be data augmentation methods in knowledge joints, sir? Okay. What are the data augmentation methods in knowledge joint? So the the idea data augmentation, yeah. Okay. So phase database, like in the phase database, it's already normalized, and what they have is only RxNorm names, and uh, they have Medra, but there are there are a lot of these vocabularies. It's not only RX norms or the, it's not only Medras, but there are other things like SNOMED. All these have like different vocabularies, and UMLS is is a resource that kind of tries to bring all these vocabularies into one semantic network. So UMLS has put in efforts. Like I think it has like 153 uh, knowledge resources. Which were which were built by a lot of these medical hospitals. Like there is ICD-9 coding, there is uh, there is SNOMED coding. So they want to try to uh, put these things together. So our idea is because we we are not, we are not doing at the concept level. So if you have observed here, so we transformed our our graph to word level graph. So we, we transformed the bipartite graph that we have in the original uh, phase to a word level graph, which means like we are capturing the word level similarities here, but if we just use the phase database, you may not have all the words that you want. So maybe uh, I just want to give an example. So in phase database, uh, you may see hypertension, but you won't see BP because it's an abbreviation. But if you expand it to all UMLS resources, you will get the BP. You will get the BP in your corpus as well. So now that you will have a representation for hypertension as well as BP, that kind of helps the overall uh, neural network model. So that's the idea. Thank you, sir. Second question, sir. One more question only. So you are using rules for sentence demarcation. Yes. So can't you use deep learning model for the same? This yes. is the question from our participant. Yes. Okay. Let's go there. Should I have a question, Dr. Bharat? Yeah. Bharat, oh, yeah. Yeah, I heard that. So I'm trying to go to the slide so I can show like why it's... Uh... Yeah, sure, sir. This is how doctors search for information <laughs> in the EHR notes. Uh, maybe somewhere, uh, maybe here, like in the deep learning slides. Nice. Okay. So definitely we can do that. I mean, it's not like we can do uh, deep learning uh, for this, yeah. but the problem is you have to create ground truths for this. So no one is really willing to create any training data for these kinds of stuff these days. Why? I mean, the people are not really investing money in the fundamental uh, technologies. The problem is, think, think about in the perspective of, you know, commercial organization uh, like IBM or someone. So why would they actually invest a lot of money in identifying sentence boundaries and you can get only, you know, maybe 0.5% better accuracy or 0 0.05, excuse me, 0 0.05, a, a minor chance, that too. So people are not really taking a big steps, especially in the sentence uh, segmentation or tokenization. And also with, with respect to EHRs, maybe even with the deep learning uh, models, I mean, th there were no, no systems out there that tried that. There were some things which are for de-identifying the text and uh, there was a corpus that we have experimented internally. We didn't do much. I, I mean, we actually tried that uh, within our uh, team. So there is a corpus that is available uh, for, for actually doing sentence segmentation using deep learning models. It didn't do much like when you actually use the rules. So it's really, uh, it didn't make a big difference, especially for the EHRs. You need rules. You need, uh, bo so the, the point is there was a paper from IBM uh, rule-based systems are dead. Uh, and then the, after the colon, it says long live uh, rule-based systems. 
So the idea is basically you can't get away from them. You can just rely on deep learning system also all the time. So that's the answer. Yeah. Thank you, sir. One final question, sir. What are the current state of art technologies for applications of AI in telemedicine, sir? Sorry, what is the question? Sorry. What are the what are the current state of art uh, uh, technologies for applications of AI in telemedicine? So, if you can see, this is one one application, but the the, the shift is happening um, for people to consume through their phones rather than you know providing uh, providing the technology to the doctor. So, it is getting into the hands of us. Us means like people. So. Things like, you know, we have uh, apps that have been developed, phone apps, like where you can track your BP, where you can basically track your whole health history, where you can measure uh, how much stressed you are. There are all these skin conductance uh, applications. So these kinds of things will come in the future, like within your hand. So it will immediately alert you, like it, it will be a tool uh, with you. So it will tell you, hey, your BP is going up. Uh, you have a temperature of this much, ba basically based on the skin conductance. Because even with the whole COVID-19 situation, the skin, the, the, the companies that are working on thermal temperature or thermal recognition using AI technologies are becoming huge. So uh, at least the stock prices are going huge. So the, the overall idea is like, okay, so if you can put like a thermal recognizer uh, when, you, when you go to an airport, so you just walk in, you don't have to do anything. The system will automatically detect your temperatures or skin conductance and tell you, hey, your temperatures are up, so maybe you want like a second scan. So these kinds of things will uh, evolve in the future. Thank so, you, sir. Doctor, uh, Doctor Bharat. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, I have a small this thing because in mathematics background, I just want to ask you one this thing. Do you adapt any mathematical transforms for convoluting them issue into a neural network? Uh, yeah, they, they, so if you, um, so this one has actually convolution, sir. So the CNN uh, is convolutional neural network. So, that, yeah. so the the idea is so there are convolutions uh, that have been done at the character level. So CNNs are have been used again for a long time, both in the uh, both in imaging world as well as the text world. But the only difference is uh, why BiLSTM is better is BiLSTM has a memory component and CNN doesn't have a memory component. So the memory helps C BiLSTM CRF remember the long distance relationships. But CNN was used to, to, uh, to obtain the character uh, convolutions and represent at the word level. So that's what we did, sir. In that context, uh, there is a problem with the deadly dog cycling. Has any adverse effect when you are convoluting them? Sorry, yes, sorry. Yes, this uh, doxycycline. Yes, sir. Do does it have any adverse effect in convolutions? Issues? Uh, with regard to BLSTM. So doxycycline, I yeah. doxycycline is, I, I didn't yes. get the question, sir. Sorry, so, sir. Doxycycline is basically the life saving drug. So when you are using this, sir, does this any, does it have any effect of the, this convolution issues? When I, you are injecting a patient, right? No, 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 sir. So this is, this convolution is basically from, for the text, right, sir? For text, then, then also. Thank yeah, you. Thank this you. is only for the text. Yeah. It is related with some position and uh, knowledge joints, actually. In that issue, also it matters, sir. Yeah, this is all text, sir. This is all yeah, text. That part. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Now over to CRK, sir. CRK, sir. Please. Uh, OK. Uh, Dr. Bharat, I mean, uh, thank you very much for your uh, I mean, uh, state of the art uh, NLB and what is happening in uh, the top uh, research centers in the world. And uh, it, in fact, it has uh, benefited uh, each and uh, every one of the participants. And you have already, you have also uh, taken us through the future scope of work also. So I would like to, on behalf of uh, MJ, I would like to thank you and all the participants for this uh, inaugural uh, day, first day series started by Bharat from country Bharat. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you so thank much, you. sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bharat. Thank you very thank much. You, thank, thank you, sir. sir. Great question. Yeah. Hello? Uh, uh, yeah, the technical team can announce that uh, we are going to share the slides and uh, the all the information at the end of the session. I think at the